On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking about the Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter's moon with project staff scientist Aaron Leonard. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 97, recorded on February 9th, 2024. Attempt no landing there. Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome from a cold, uncaring solar system. And you're back to This Week in Space, the Europa Clipper edition. I'm Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of Ad Astra Magazine. It's my honor to be joined, as always, by the intriguing Tarek Malik, editor in space, editor-in-chief of space.com. How are you today? Uh, I'll chief? take I'll take editor of space. I, I, I'll take that. No, I think that, that sounds like a good title to have. So <laughs> doing well. Doing well, Rod. I, I finally figured out where we're going to watch the solar eclipse later this year. So uh, where? I have a little bit, uh, hopefully in uh, Saranac Lake in uh, in New York. It seems like it's a really pretty place to go see it. But we're still working out some travel arrangements. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, but it'll be stale by then. I'll be down in, in Austin, Texas, where it'll be nice and fresh by the time <laughs> it's going to be stale. Um, today, we are going to be joined, it is our pleasure, to be joined by Aaron Leonard, who's a project staff scientist on the Europa Clipper mission at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, but before that, a couple of housekeeping moments. Uh, first, I want people to remember that Twit needs your help, and we want to keep our show free to you. So uh, please j- consider joining Club Twit for $7 a month. We'd appreciate it, and uh, the network would, too. Now, my joke. I'm, I was waiting on, like, pins and needles. So. Yeah. Well, those pins will soon be puncturing your, your posterior. Hey, Tarek. <laughs> yes, Rod. What does Earth say to tease the other planets? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. What does Earth say? You guys have no life. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? I didn't know our home planet was a jerk. Wow. So. Yeah. Well, and because that, that I found that joke this time. That no, I like it. The jerky credit for it. Um, <laughs> as always, we invite you. No, no. We implore you to please join the lame joke sp- space joke squad and send us your best or worst space joke. You guys aren't keeping up. So uh, get with it. And don't forget to do us a <laughs> solid and make sure to like subscribe and all that cool podcast stuff. Now. Let's get the headlines. And our first headline is not a happy one. This is space news and and just about every other press outlet in the country in the last couple of days. And so we're talking about the JPL layoffs. Now, I just want to predicate this by saying, you know, I've I've worked in and out of the lab and around the lab for decades because I live close to it. So, of course, we follow the news because it's a local NASA field center and we've had rounds of layoffs probably on average about every eight to 10 years for decades, sometimes savage. Uh, But for some reason, this time, which is in the eight to 10% uh, range of the staff and contractors, made international headlines. Yeah, yeah. Which was kind of interesting. So tell us what you know. So, so just to just to kind of put the the, the facts out there, uh, basically this week, uh, NASA uh, uh, leadership at JPL, as well as as uh, at headquarters, because the uh, the NASA administrator Bill Nelson had a whole uh, statement on on this. But they announced that they were they were laying off about five hundred and thirty uh, employees. That's eight percent and forty contractors. So that's about eight percent of the workforce there at um, at, uh, at at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with. Um, uh, and, and they're saying that it's it's part of the efforts because of just some budget stuff that they're facing. Um, they say specifically that it's because of the lack of an actual official fiscal year 2024 budget that Congress keeps passing these continuing resolutions, which uh, is affecting their ability to plan what they need to spend, plus cuts to the Mars sample return mission, which is a huge project, of course, at, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They land things on Mars. That's like what they're known for, you know, mm. and this project that has been under increasing scrutiny because of its, uh, its, its budget, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Washington and, and, and its hurdles as well. There was like a recent report about just how challenging it was and that it was going to be more difficult and more uh, expensive than, than, uh, than, than previously thought, um, has been, um, kind of a, like a key, a key driver. And so the, the folks at space news, and I believe this was Jeff Faust. Uh, yes, it was him. The, 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 the man with the plan over at space news, you know, he flagged that, that, that these layoffs were, 
in response to NASA's decision back in November to cut budget spending on the Mars sample return mission uh, because they're operating on this continuum resolution at 2023 levels, not at 2024 levels or anything, mm. um, that, that doesn't include for the extra spending they need to, to really develop the, the sample return uh, mission, which is like a... Um, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's big differences there. Like in the, in the, uh, the house, they have like a, a billion dollar uh, funding mission for, uh, for this 949 million, but then there's only 300 million of funding for that mission in, um, in the Senate. And they don't know, NASA doesn't know what they can plan for. So they have to like make their spending uh, decisions now for what they might end up getting. It's just really hard to see. Because, and I think that to your point, and I'll try to keep it short, but to your point about why this cut, these cuts are getting the, the attention now right. is because of the highs that we're coming off of. You know, just last week, uh, NASA said goodbye to the Ingenuity helicopter, uh, a, a JPL project that was designed for one month, lasted three years, designed for five flights, flew more than 70. Uh, they've got these two nuclear powered rovers exploring Mars. Uh, doing gangbuster work, and they are known for daring mighty things. So, th in the last few uh, few months, uh, they have come off of all of these highs, uh, of all of these amazing things that they've been doing, and they're not low profile. I mean, the the helicopter itself was international news, and then you get hit a week later with these uh, substantial uh, uh, workforce uh, layoffs uh, from the people that brought you all of that, and that's kind of, I think, the sticker shock from the public side, it's like, we have these people that can do these amazing things, build things that last, you know, years, decades, even on other planets. And now we're, we're going to cut funding there because of what's going on in Washington right now, which doesn't make a lot of sense because if you want to do the big things, you kind of have to pay for them, you know? And uh, it's, it's why we've seen a lot of challenges with other parts of the space program too. Well, I think you bring up a good point about the the value for money spent at JPL. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, this is because of Mars sample return. That budget's ballooned to $10 billion, which is in uh, James Webb's space telescope range. Yeah. So it's a lot. And we've been studying Mars sample return since the late 60s. Soviets looked hard at it. We looked hard at it. In both cases, it was always going to be expensive. In the old days, they were talking about, I think, two or three Saturn V launches to make it work. So it was a big, heavy program. It was going to cost a lot of money. Uh, let's just bear in mind, I, I, I suggest that, as, as you pointed out uh, many times over on this show, J, you know, the value return that JPL gives us. Yeah, You get a rover-like opportunity that was supposed to last three months and it lasted 14 freaking years. I know. So, you know, <laughs> what would happen on the Mars sample return? I mean, you're still going to have rovers left on the planet, uh, a fetch rover. I believe and maybe, a maybe even two helicopters. We don't, yeah. you know, after, so. after all is said and done. So it's just, you know, and just for perspective, not that I'm pointing any particular fingers here, but Oh yes, I am. Uh, the Mars sample return budget is about one, 113th of what the F 35 will cost within a couple of years. <laughs> not that we don't need fighter planes, oh. but good Lord, people, can you just shut the tap off and stop paying for it? All right, I'll shut up now. Space.com brings us Axiom 3 astronauts splash down. That's right. This is like hot off the presses because this happened this morning. I got <laughs> <up>. <laughs> But uh, the latest private mission to the International Space Station is in the books. That's Axiom Space's uh, AX-3 uh, mission, which launched four astronauts to the space station on January 18th. Uh, it came back to Earth today. That is about uh, uh, 21 days of in orbit time. Um, and that is the longest, uh, the longest private mission to the space station for Axiom space. Uh, so that's a new record. Um, this mission was really interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it was, uh, the first all European Axiom space kind of private mission, uh, to fly on a SpaceX rocket launched on the SpaceX, uh, crew dragon, uh, freedom. And it included, uh, uh, like their chief astronaut at Axiom Space, that's Michael Lopez uh, Alegria. If that name sounds familiar, it's because he's a former uh, NASA astronaut who also commanded the International Space Station. And, uh, and this is his second flight. So he's the first 
a two time flyer on uh, Axiom Space. He's the, the he uh, commanded the first mission to AX one. Peggy Whitson commanded AX two last year, and uh, and then it had uh, another familiar name in private space flight. Walter v- Via Day, uh, I think is how you pronounce it. He is an Italian Air Force colonel, and it, the reason it sounds familiar is because he also launched on on a Virgin Galactic. Uh, a, a mission, uh, their first kind of commercial flight uh, last year. So he's he's mm-hmm. got some orbital time in him. He was the pilot for the mission. Uh, then you have Turkey's first al- uh, astronaut, Alper um, uh, Jezuravach. Jezurav- <laughs> Easy for Je- you to say. Je- 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 I- I'm, I'm very embarrassed now, but uh, Jezuravachi, um, and he was the f- he's Turkey's first astronaut. And he had a whole science mission in campaign. He actually spoke to the president while he was up there. Um, and then rounding up the crew, and this is an interesting one, and this is uh, Sweden's uh, Marcus One, a European Space Agency reserve astronaut. And so he's the first of the reserve astronaut corps to fly him. And that's a program that ESA put together where they sign people on for countries that don't like maybe have the, the funding to, to train an, uh, an astronaut full time, uh, but they'll have them in reserve. And then if a flight, uh, if the country buys a flight, then they'll train the astronaut to fly. So interesting, interesting path to space for him. He took some amazing photos, by the way, Marcus Want of the earth from space, uh, including on his last night in orbit, um, uh, like sunsets and like nighttime earth just absolutely gorgeous uh, that people should go back and check out. But you know, the 56 different experiments o- over the last uh, three weeks. And um, uh, so it wasn't just space tourism uh, for tourism's sake. And finally uh, <laughs> they got like an extra four or five days out of it because their, de- their landing was uh, delayed by, um, uh, uh, by weather on earth. They landed uh, about, uh, just off the shore of Daytona Beach, uh, Florida, and uh, and so they had to wait for for clear weather, and that was weather that had been delaying like NASA's launch of the Pace mission to uh, the last week too. So it was uh, it was uh, uh, a lot of uh, impeding a lot of traffic going up and coming down. And finally, from space dot com, we have what sounds like the next Tom Hanks mystery mega movie, <laughs> Renaissance era astronomy text hide secret message. That's right. That's right. So this this one came from Elizabeth Howell over at space.com. She found this story and it's absolutely uh, awesome. Basically, the Rochester Institute of Technology, which is in Buffalo, uh, New York, uh, received a couple of Renaissance era books as like gifts. They were from like a collector, someone that, that had, had them. And one of them actually is by Copernicus. And, and uh, uh, but the, the other is this 15th century book by a 13th century scientist uh, and monk called Johannes de, and here's another name, Sacrobosco. I think I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and it's, it's Johannes's book that has the, these, these, these scientists, uh, these researchers at the university uh, peaked uh, because they think it's what's called a palimpsest. Right? Do, do you know what a palimpsest is, Rod? Because I had to look this word up today. <laughs> so, uh, not until you suggest it. No. Yeah. So it is. It is. It is a book where the you know the material that they used to to make these books was really precious. And if they don't want a book, but they want to write another one, they would wash it off and then write a new book on top of it. And apparently, they think that's what happened with really? this book that they have on and the so, parchment. They'd yeah. Wash the so, parchment? Oh. so that the parchment has this previous book underneath it, uh, what is there now? And the interesting thing about these two books together is that Johannes's book, uh, which is in Latin and it's called De Sphera Mundi, On the Sphere of the World, puts the earth at the center of the whole universe, right? And, and, uh, uh, and, and then they have this book with the book, the 16th century book by Nicholas uh, Copernicus, which is that Earth is not the center; that the Sun is the center. So you've got these kind of juxtaposing views of of Earth's role in the cosmos, and so they're going to start using instruments to look at Johannes's book, uh, where they can kind of look past the surface text and see the remains of the original text behind it. And we're going to see like what's in there uh, in the near future, um, and it's just kind of a, a neat uh, uh, kind of mystery story. Uh, for for ancient astronomy, that I think you, as you mentioned, would make Dan proud, uh, Dan Brown proud. <laughs> so, and and will finally prove that the Earth is in fact flat because we've been <laughs> working on that for a long time. All right, uh, and finally, your last headline: Aunt Pruitt's kid. Oh, <laughs> give a nod to Aunt. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just I saw I saw in, in Ant's uh, uh, Twitter that his son uh, has uh, formally declared for Oregon uh, to 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 attend there and play and play football. So uh, just a big big huge congrats congrats and a shout out uh, there. Big achievement, uh, obviously big big milestone for the family. And uh, yeah, yeah, go go Ducks. So and, and, and Ant was was our previous board op and co producer and friend of the family. So hats off to you, Ant. Be nice to your kid. He's working hard. All right. We will be right back with JPL's Aaron Leonard of the Europa Clipper Mission. Go nowhere. Okay, Aaron, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure having you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, creating the future of humanity. Um, (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with Europa Clipper and how you got there? Yeah. Uh, so on Europa Clipper, I'm a project staff scientist, which means I work in the project science group uh, for the project scientist. And uh, what we really do there is one of the things we do is um, kind of bridge the communication gap between the scientists on the team and the engineering team and just make sure that sort of information is flowing freely between between the two, right? Because the engineers are building the spacecraft, which is really great. And the scientists have to be able to get all the scientists science that they need from the spacecraft eventually. So we want to make sure that all that information and communication is flowing very freely. Um, the other thing I kind of do is we, you know, we have 10 investigations on Europa Clipper. And so just kind of organizing them all together and making sure that they are all moving in the same direction. We're moving together as one team. Um, that, that That's another part of my job. So years ago, I wrote a book about the Curiosity Project, and part mm-hmm. of that involved going to a couple of the landing site selection workshops that they had. And uh, I don't know if, if your job has any similarity to the dynamic I saw there, but watching the science people, and that includes geologists and geophysicists and lots of other people, and the engineers debate about landing sites where, of course, the scientists want all the interesting rumpled up rocks and valleys and canyons and mountains and all that. And the engineers are saying, no, just give me a nice flat plane like a pool table <laughs> made out of dirt. I mean, do you have to mediate those kind of concerns or is it more immediate than that? Definitely. I mean, you know, we are thinking about how we're going to operate the spacecraft and even direct, you know, analogies of that come up, right? The scientists want every little bit of the, that they can possibly get. They want to eke every little bit of science that they possibly can out of every observation, out of every flyby. And the engineers also want that, but they also want to make sure the spacecraft is safe and that they that we stay within, you know, different different constraints. And uh, um, so it's, it's always a compromise between those two things. And um, they, you know, scientists and engineers don't always speak the exact same language either. So, so making sure you're bridging that sort of language gap between the two groups also, uh, I think is, is, is critical. Can I, can I ask Aaron, uh, uh, about your path mm-hmm. just to space, right? Cause I, I was yeah. uh, doing some research earlier. I saw that you have a, uh, that you studied uh, astrophysics and planetary science at, at yeah. Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have a PhD. So we should be calling, calling you doctor, I think, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> In, uh, sure. in, in in planetary geology, and and I'm just curious if that was something that you had always been interested in that then led you uh, to the role that you have now, or did you kind of fall into planetary geology by accident through uh, some some event that just you know grabbed you and, and wouldn't let you go? A series of fortunate events, I'll say, is how I came to to planetary science. Um, I went to school, like you said, at at Berkeley for originally I was really wanted to do math. All I knew is that I was good at math. And so I I was it was great. And then as soon as they stopped using numbers in math, you know, just what they do really in college and and stuff. it, you know, became a little too theoretical for me. And so I was like, why don't I do applied math? Applied math is essentially physics. Okay, but physics is really broad. Why don't we just, you know, pick a branch of physics? Um, astrophysics sounds great. I was, I've always been into space. Uh, my dad uh, works as a rocket scientist for um, the Air Force for a long time oh, wow. when I was growing up. So he really introduced me to space uh, when I was little. And so I've always been fascinated with space. So astrophysics really called to me. 
And then after a couple of years of doing astrophysics in college, um, that also became a little just out there for me, right? Like lots of, you know, black holes, dark energy, dark matter, things you can't see, things we'll never really be able to, to prove one way or another, things that get a little philosophical. And so I wanted to do something a little more tangible. And so I found uh, planetary science, really fell in love with planetary science and, um, just started working on icy satellites for my PhD. Um, so I <laughs> didn't even know anything really about Europa before I started my PhD. And I didn't hadn't really taken much of any geology uh, before I started my PhD. And now I call myself a geologist. I've done some structural geology on Earth and on icy bodies around the solar system. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, so kind of a random, <laughs> a randomish walk, not too random, randomish walk. Hey, Tarek, if we had had better parental support, we would have been better mathematicians, but no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where I blame it. You know, it's interesting because the first story, and, and, then, and then, I'm sorry, Rod, go, you can go ahead. The first story I ever did for space.com, I ever wrote as like a member of the team, like 20 whatever years ago, was about Europa and, and, uh, and it's a, a possible ocean, uh, there. So I'm very enthralled at how you got there as well. Uh, because it's kind of like an, in this mission is like a little bit of a bookend for me, hopefully not an end, but like, I guess the, the part of that goes to the next shelf. Uh, for yes. <laughs> the next chapter. Yeah. Next book in the series. There you go. <laughs> So we, we've heard a lot about icy moons over the last couple of decades, and with good reason. Um, what made Europa a good choice as a target as opposed to Enceladus or somewhere else? Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, so like, like you mentioned with Enceladus, right, we think Europa is, is one of the best places to look for life in our solar system. Um, that also includes Enceladus. Europa is... is and for slightly different reasons, uh, Europa and Enceladus have both their strengths and, and their weaknesses in that um, sort of habitability uh, question, whether they're potentially habitable by extraterrestrial life. Uh, Europa has the benefit, well, one, of being a little closer. It also, I, I would say, has the benefit of, of having uh, salts on the surface and evidence for, for salts. And salts are, are really important right? because it's giving us that evidence that the water and rock are interacting uh, within Europa. And it's also... Um, you, you're producing oxidants on the surface that if you can get them into a reducing ocean would provide an energy source for life that might be in that ocean. And, and I mean, like Europa, just, just for folks that might not be aware, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's not like a small moon that we're no. talking about. This is the sixth largest moon in the solar system. Uh, one of the five prime that Galileo himself saw. That's why they're you know, they're called the Galilean uh, mm -hmm. moons themselves. But the ocean, like how long have we known about the iciness of Europa, uh, Aaron, that, that, it, that it is this target that we want to go and send a mission like Europa Clipper uh, to? Because it, I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, the last 20 years uh, for me, but this, this it's, it feels like in the last few years, the oceanness of the icy part of Europa seems to have really just like we've been learning much, much more of it now. And I'm just curious if you can kind of like explain how we, how we figured out that it, it wasn't just a big ball of rock in the first. Yeah. Place. Yeah. So, I mean, we knew it wasn't uh, just a big ball of rock ever since Voyager flew by um, uh, Voyager two and, and captured images of Europa. And we thought right when Voyager was going out to the outer solar system that we were just going to kind of see all these dead and cratered icy moons out there. And then when you took pictures of Europa, when you took pictures of Io or Ganymede, right, you saw these really potentially very active moons uh, out in the outer solar system, something we totally didn't really expect. Um, so like you said, Europa is about the size of our moon. It has an ice shell with a liquid water ocean underneath. And the way we think we know it has that liquid water ocean underneath the ice shell um, was through data taken by the Galileo spacecraft, which was in the Jovian system in the late 90s and early 2000s, and it detected what we call an induced field, uh, induced magnetic field around Europa. And so Europa is living in Jupiter's magnetic field environment, and as it moves around Jupiter, it experiences Jupiter's varying magnetic field. And if you have a conductor that's moving through a varying magnetic field, you actually induce another magnetic field. And so uh -huh. what Galileo, what the uh, magnetometer and the plasma instruments measured at Europa was that induced field. And so we know that Europa has this conductive layer within it that we think is a salty liquid water ocean. Wow. Wow. So, so um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
One of the things that was so compelling about Enceladus was these massive plumes of what yeah. we assume are, are, are warm ocean water coming out. And I know there's been work done on on uh, future methods of collecting those. Do do have we confirmed plumes? We have you confirmed <laughs> plumes at uh, Europa, or is that still a question? Uh, well, definitely not personally, but yes. Um, also, uh, yeah, we we have not, I would say, confirmed plumes at Europa. There are definitely hints of plumes at Europa, um, but they're definitely not, we'll say, as obvious as the ones at Enceladus. Of course, we didn't know about the plumes at Enceladus until we went there with the Cassini spacecraft too, and really got to um, see and understand the, uh, more about the plume at Enceladus. But Enceladus is also very small, and it has a very large plume, so it's um, you know, just to give you a sense of the size, right? It's I think it's like smaller than the state of Texas or it's, it's, it's very small moon, uh, Enceladus is. And so, uh, Europa is a lot larger, which means it's gravitational field is a lot larger, which means that if Europa has plumes, they're not going to be as ex like as, uh, extensive. They're not going to be as geysery. They're not going to go quite as far away from the moon. They're not going to be as obvious and as easy to see. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we may not have detected, firmly detected plumes at Europa yet. But there have been a couple of tentative detections with um, with the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think there's still a debate in the scientific community whether whether uh, that, those are actual detections, but they're really intriguing. And that's something we're definitely going to be looking for at Europa with Europa Clipper. And a lot of the instruments will be able to contribute to that. And so I think by the time that Europa Clipper um, finishes its prime mission, uh, we will definitely have an answer on whether Europa has plumes or not. So if there are plumes, does this spacecraft have any way of uh, a mass spectrometer or something to directly test them? Or do you have to do it by inference with spectra or something? Um, so both, right? We do have a mass spectrometer, mass specs, and a dust detector, SUDA, um, that'll both, if we find a plume and fly through a plume, they'll, they'll be able to sample that plume. Mm. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was, <laughs> you mentioned uh, like the salty, like hints and, and clues. <laughs> it just got me thinking, uh, and I'm sorry if this sounds pedantic, but what, <laughs> like if I compare it to the ocean on earth, like mm -hmm. I know how salty that is, you know, I've been in the ocean. Right. Um, is, is that what it would taste like, you know, for, yeah. uh, for, 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 if, if we could go over and get a, get a, get a couple question. of stuff. What does, no, yeah, what does pretty Europa's much. ocean taste like? I I, it, it should be, uh, we think it right now that it's a similar saltiness to, to Earth's ocean. So it would be actually very similar, we oh. think, to, to Earth's ocean. Of course, we're going to go back with the clipper and get better measurements of that induced magnetic field, which will tell us about how salty that ocean might be. So we're going to constrain that better. But in the parameter space that we have right now for the saltiness of Europa's ocean, it's about the same as Earth's ocean. And and our our ocean, you know, if, you know our saltwater ocean is full of life on Earth. Mm -hmm, and right? so I assume that the, the the one of the big draws is what that could mean for life on on well, i guess under i guess europa right because it would be in 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 the subsurface uh area i mean do we have any clues about how warm that might be or or or, or what it would be like uh, down there what the chances are uh, for right them? yeah so one of the reasons we think europa is such a good place to look for life like you said is because of that liquid water ocean and we think we think from what we know on Earth right now, we think that's where life originated on Earth, right? At these mid-ocean ridges uh, where there was heat, there was rock, there was water, and you have these, you know, black smokers, white smokers producing all of this sort of interesting chemistry down at the ocean floor. And we think something like that could be going on on Europa too, where we have, we know we have a rocky core, we have heat because we're generating heat as, as we orbit Jupiter. So as Europa orbits Jupiter, it's in a slightly eccentric orbit, which means the orbit's not quite circular, which means that it has a differential force that it exerts on Europa as it goes around. And that differential force kind of causes Europa to, to squeeze and flex and breathe almost a little bit as it goes around Jupiter. And that generates a lot of heat in the rocky interior. So we have rock, we have heat, we have water from that liquid water ocean and then time, right? Those are the four main ingredients that we think we need for life. And Europa seems to have all of those. So wow. we're very excited about what we could potentially find in Europa's ocean. So I have a two part question. Mm -hmm. um, the first half and, and they're they're large, large questions. The first half is <laughs> I, I know that the uh, the pathway to the Europa Clipper mission has been 
a challenging one. It's been mm-hmm. on on the books one way or another for a long time. Um, I think maybe close to 20 years. Something like that. Yeah, it depends on when you start counting. But <laughs> yeah, so can you talk a little bit about about whatever you know about that? Because I remember it being talked about long ago. It was on, it was off, it was up, it was down. But we're not going to yeah. be going to put it on. Oh, we'll put it on SLS. Oh, wait, that's expensive. Let's do something else. Yeah, uh, there's a great book out and I'm totally blanking on the author's name right now. So maybe you don't want to include this, but it's called The Mission. Uh, you, uh, you can talk about that if you'd like. But um Uh, So I'm not super familiar. I haven't been around in the field for two decades, but I've been working on Clipper for about 10 years now since uh, ever since I started grad school is actually when I started working on Clipper, which is when the instrument uh, opportunity um, announcement of opportunity came out when they selected instruments. And so I've been working on Clipper ever since it really got its start in phase A or um, yeah, in, in phase A. And so Um, So I've been around for that 10 years. But before that, like you said, there was a long pathway even in the 10 years before that on getting Clipper to that stage. And um, that really has been around ever since the Galileo mission was was winding down in the early 2000s. And so we have the Galileo mission winding down in the early 2000s. We know Europa is a really interesting target from all that data that Galileo did collect then. And so right away it was started um, thinking about a mission to Europa. And, you know, over the years uh, since then, it's been, um, you know, formulating that mission. It's been, you know, budget uncertainty and budget issues and um, and overcoming those uh, both in Congress and just in general, right? Um, There's been a lot of challenges. The road's been very winding. The concept for the mission changed a lot in that 10 years between we'll say 2004 and 2014 for lack of a better um, time frame. And what we ended up with with, uh, is Europa Clipper, um, a mission that could really explore the habitability of of Europa and also fit into a budget that everyone could swallow. And I know you can't say this, but I would personally like to remind those in Congress and the executive branch who might be listening, if any, that... uh, this this data that that drove some of the decisions about Eroka came from the Galileo mission, which was saved from certain doom by the clever people at JPL because for a variety of reasons related mostly to decisions about the space shuttle, um, Galileo's uh, antenna did not deploy properly. And a lot of this work was done dribbling out on the equivalent of a 300 baud modem, which I don't think Aaron even probably was alive when we were <laughs> using them, but I was uh, to try and get the data back from from uh, the Jovian system. So brilliant work by by JPL at that time, and uh, we should open the pipeline for more cash. Oh, just yeah. my I opinion. Mean- all that data from Galileo was taken on a tape recorder. And I mean, I am old enough to know what tape recorders are. So it was <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing, really. Well, it really is. And, and just speaking of, of that kind of uh, technological brilliance from the lab, because the contract that I had that they had to let go uh, was a, a book we, we did every year about the, some of the, the technological highlights from JPL, which I really enjoyed doing. It's worth remembering that the Voyagers have been out there for 45 years, however long it's been, operating on tape recorders. And it's, mm-hmm. it looks like a almost like a one-inch uh, TV video deck from the 1970s, 1980s, with that tape going back and forth for 45 years, <laughs> driving those things. Anyway, sorry, this is Rod getting into old man mode here. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit, and then I'm going to turn it back to Tariq, but let's talk a little bit uh, about how you, you, you kind of touched on it, but it's always foreign to me when people can actually understand math well enough to go get PhDs. That's a concept <laughs> that I can't get my head wrapped around. I, I, when I was in grad school, I asked my advisor about going to the PhD program. He said, you ought to go back and work at television. Said, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so it's not for what, everyone. <laughs> well, yeah. What's, what's the pathway for, uh, say we got a, a, a younger person listening to this show that's mm-hmm. interested in this kind of thing. What was your pathway into this? Yeah, so uh, my pathway into the job I had now was uh, really, again, kind of a, a series of, of fortunate events, but also um, a lot of hard work, right? So it's uh, <clears throat> I went to undergrad, like I said, for, for a degree that was related to something that I knew I wanted to do at some point, but I, I kind of 
like we talked about, random walked a little bit uh, towards that. Um, when I went to grad school, I think, you know, the, the most important thing in grad school is just is persistence. Um, there's a lot of challenges uh, that you're facing in, in grad school, both, um, you know, mentally and also just, you know, being a, a grad school is a totally different uh, entity than being an undergrad. And you're really, oh God, you really yes. have to be your own person and develop your own pathway and, and being that sort of independent and, and persevering uh, through that is, is uh, really critical. Right. And then I would say the way I ended up um, at JPL and, and with Europa Clipper is, is really um, a bit of luck. And then also, perseverance and and um asking a lot of questions to the right people um i um my advisor at ucla was actually writing a paper um with um bob Papalardo at jpl who's the project scientist who's now the project scientist for europa clipper but he wasn't um at the time and i wasn't planning on doing anything in the summer between undergrad and grad school i was going to take time off like a normal person and go do <laughs> something um interesting um but he was like no 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 don't do that that's silly uh why don't you go work with this guy at jpl and like figure out what you're going to do your phd on. Um, and so I, I did that, thankfully. And um, that summer, I did some geologic mapping of Europa, and that laid the groundwork for my PhD and everything I did in my PhD, and then um, for all the work I've done after that. So it's really, sometimes it's about being in the right place at the right time, but it's also about persevering, asking questions, talking to as many people as you can, and um, trusting yourself, I'd say. Well, bravo. Thank you. That's a great answer. Well, I, I have, I have so many more questions about this mission and <laughs> yeah. Europa, Aaron, but uh, first, first, I think it's time. We'll take a, a really quick break and, and then we'll come right back to it. Well, Aaron, uh, I understand now uh, why we're interested in Europa. It sounds like it's a fascinating place. Obviously uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, we've been looking at it really closely since, since Voyager, but Europa Clipper seems to be a spacecraft of like a different a different family altogether, right? Uh, yeah. It's 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 got this this moon in its crosshairs, and I had the the pleasure of of seeing it just from the little gallery at JPL uh, last year, which was really exciting uh, to see uh, because you you realize that the spacecraft they. You think about oh hey there's a photo of it, of me love it um, oh, it's it's, a, it's so much it's so much bigger than you actually uh, 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 oh yeah you know think it is when you see it uh, up close and in person and I was looking at uh, just some like fast facts about about the spacecraft and saw like it's it's gonna have like solar arrays mm -hmm. uh, the size of a of a basketball court uh, yeah. you've got 24 engines on it uh, and and I guess nine different instruments that are going to be doing mm -hmm. different things yeah. and and I'm just wondering how hard is it to build something to go oh. to a moon like this <laughs> that where you know what you want to find out but you don't know exactly what it's gonna look like mm -hmm. and then how do you build that? <laughs> So. Yeah, no, it's been a big engineering challenge, right? And it's also complicated by the fact that you're in this really intense radiation environment of Jupiter, right? Jupiter is so big, it has these um, large and very energetic radiation belts and magnetic field, and that's messing with you constantly too while, while you're in the system, right? So that just adds even more complexity on top of the engineering of having nine instruments, like you said, we actually say 10 investigations because we include the, the communications dish um, as well as one of our investigations, because we mm -hmm. use that for science also. Um, but yeah, it's it's a huge feat of engineering, really. Yeah. No way, like like more than six tons. That's crazy. Thirteen hundred yeah. pounds at launch, right? <laughs> yeah. No, and, and it, it, it is, like you said, really big. And yeah, you can see it in the high bay. Um, there's a YouTube link that everyone can watch it in the high bay. And That's right. there's usually a little mannequin in the shot. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense of scale for how large it is. It's not in the high bay right at this moment because it's up in uh, TVAC and thermal vacuum testing, but it'll be back in the next month or so. And, and for our listeners, if you go to europa.nasa.gov, there's a little live button in the upper mm -hmm. right-hand corner called the Clipper Cam. And that's where you can like see all the all the all the fun things when it's going on that's where um, you can take over control of the probe can i ask a quick question there <laughs> yeah. um d have you heard any uh talks up at jpl by a guy named john cassani over the years yeah mm -hmm. absolutely have, have you ever heard uh, i i just have to go through this. this is a story i love to tell his story about uh preparing voyager and the radiation problems 
Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so I've yeah, that's I think like one of the talks I've heard. I've heard him give a talk on on Voyager too. So his talks are always fun because he kind of loves to to stroll off the reservation, but. They were preparing for launch. I think they were pretty close, like within months or weeks. And as John tells it, he was, you know, down in down in the workshop working on something. And one of the guys came in and said, we, we got a radiation problem. He said, well, yeah, we know there's radiation there. And they said, no, there's, there's also going to be tons. I think it was tons of static generated by the wiring in the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we sent him off to uh, the Safeway down the street to buy some Reynolds wrap to wrap the cable system. Yeah. Which I thought this has to be the cheapest NASA fix in history because the Reynolds wrap was not procured through the system, but it was bought <laughs> down the street at the grocery store. And I thought that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. We have very a lot of similar concerns on Europa Clipper, too, right? Uh, we call them EMI, EMC, electromagnetic interference and compatibility concerns, right? So you have all these electronics on your spacecraft that are also producing noise. And for some of the instruments on Europa Clipper, particularly the ice penetrating radar, it needs silence, quote unquote, electromagnetic silence for, for lack of a better term um, to really get really good data. And so Europa Clipper has a large concerns about electromagnetic interference and compatibility and a lot of the investigations, the instruments and their um, all, all the electronics in the spacecraft have to be quiet um, so that we can take the data that we need. So could you just give us kind of a, a, a thumbnail of what the instrument package is and what those yeah. do? Yeah, so, okay, we'll start with the remote sensing instruments. So we have ICE, EIS, which is the camera. We have MISE, or the visible camera. We have MISE, which is the infrared spectrometer. We have Ethemus, which is the far infrared, um, more like um, uh, thermal, thermal emissions. Um, we have uh, Europa UVS, which is the UV spectrometer. We have um, Reason, which is the ice penetrating radar. And then moving more into like the in situ instruments, we have ECM, which is the magnetometer, PIMS, which is the plasma spectrometer. Uh, we have um, we have uh, gravity radio science again, which is that it was we call it investigation. It's not technically an instrument, but it uh, uses the communications dish, that huge dish that you see on the spacecraft mm -hmm. um, to do science at Europa. And then we have uh, mass specs, the mass spectrometer and SUDA, the dust analyzer. So lots of like, again, we're kind of across the electromagnetic spectrum in the in the remote sensing instruments. And then also we have those in situ instruments that are taking data uh, where we are. And and for those who are not watching the YouTube stream on this, which you probably should be, our brilliant John Salinino on the board was rolling his cursor over those instrument packages <laughs> as you were describing that, which is something I could never have done. So thank you, right. John. You're a saint. One of the unique things too about Clipper is that all of those instruments are going to be taking data at the same time. So all of the all of the instruments that have cameras associated with them are all pointed at Europa and all taking data at the same time, which sounds like something maybe logical that you would think happens all the time. But actually, typically on different spacecrafts, some some of the instruments are pointed in different directions, and you have to choose which ones you're going to observe with when you fly by a target. And on Europa, on Europa Clipper, all of those instruments are pointed the same direction on the nader deck and all of the instruments will be taking data at the same time which is again just going to produce invaluable science sorry tark i have one one quick follow-up uh are these um are these very large orbits that are essentially a flyby or mm -hmm. are they tight orbits around your yeah so we're actually orbiting jupiter and we're performing 49 flybys of europa and so one of the reasons that we do that really the primary reason that we're doing that is because of the really intense radiation environment around jupiter and so um Europa is in that really intense radiation environment. We want to stay out of that radiation environment as much as possible. So we do these really long, like looping orbits around Jupiter and these uh, flybys of Europa so that we can stay out of that radiation environment, reduce costs, reduce mass of the spacecraft, things like that. And this spacecraft is uh, solar panel powered, so you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about plutonium disposal at end of yes. mission, right? Yeah. Well, everything... Aaron JPL builds seems to last forever, uh, and so <laughs> I mean we, we just we just kind of said goodbye last week to to the Ingenuity spacecraft oh, yeah. or Ingenuity helicopter on Mars mm -hmm. that was supposed to land you know fly for a month and it lasted for three years. Yeah, uh, is is forty nine orbits kind of like the lifetime because of that radiation environment that you think, or or could you squeeze a few oh. more? 
I'm sure. Well, we uh, would love there to be an extended mission, right? So that's the prime mission, those 49 flybys. That's what we'll, we'll have achieved our science goals after those 49 flybys. And then I'm sure we will have more science goals, even maybe potentially even better science goals for a potential extended mission. And we won't know how long that extended mission could be until we really start flying the spacecraft, seeing how it reacts to the radiation environment, seeing how much propellant we're using, things like that, right? So we don't know how long it's going to last and you're never guaranteed an extended mission, um, but we do expect that it'll probably last longer than that. And, and if you are taking readings concurrently with all of the instruments at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was looking at some of the key questions. How deep is the ocean? You know, what's mm -hmm. the chemistry like? Uh, I would assume, you know, it would, it might have like, like what are those, those currents and whatnot in our, mm -hmm. in our own ocean. And, yeah. I, and I would, I would, I guess the, the question is, is, is taking simultaneous uh, measurements like that. Um, uh, does it allow you to, to, I guess, marry all of those conditions of what's happening at those different levels at the same time mm -hmm. uh, to give you like, like a, a clear snapshot versus having to piece it together over. Definitely. Levels. Right. You, you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly what it is, right? When you're really trying to address these big questions about the habitability of an ocean, the habitability of a body, you require different lines of evidence and you really want to have all those lines of evidence at the same time, right? So you're not trying to piece together and have random holes in your puzzle, right? You want to have, um, as much data as from as many different viewpoints, if you will, from different from like uh, the infrared, from the UV, from, uh, you know, the magnetometer, from the mass spectrometer, all at the same time to, to really create that holistic picture, because habitability is not a yes or no, an easy yes or no question. You really need all of these lines of evidence to come together to, to really determine whether um, the ocean might be habitable. All right. Well, I have a burning question, but first we need to go to a break. So go nowhere. We'll be right back. So it, it, this is the, the the wonderful question that Tarek tossed in. So I'm going to steal it from him. If you had one big question you wanted to answer on, I mean, hopefully we'll answer a lot of questions on this, this mission. But if you had one big question or um, solution you were looking for, what would it be? Yeah, so as a geologist, uh, I am interested in all of the really amazing and enigmatic surface features on, on Europa. Um, we have these really long and really complex ridges and bands that stretch across Europa's surface. We have these really crazy looking chaos terrains. And so really, you know, getting a better understanding of how some of those features form is what I'm personally really interested in. Mm -hmm. But one of the um, fundamental keys to understanding that geology is really about um, how thick the ice shell is, right? So we we have a couple, we have a range, we have a guess of how thick we think Europa's ice shell is, but really getting that nailed down is something I'm really interested in and I'm really excited for, for to see what Clipper produces on that. So, sorry, Tarek, I have a follow-up. So I guess if if that's something you think about when you, when you lie down to go off to slumber <laughs> at night, I suspect you probably also spend time following uh, what what some of the preliminary work is on getting through that ice shell someday. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I haven't seen updates on that in a couple of years, but I've seen everything from melters to mm -hmm. little squirmy robots that were tested up in the Arctic that you know would mm -hmm. kind of snake their way down to I forget what the name of it was, but there was another one that was an inverted rover that once below the ice would drive upside down our ice sheets and Definitely, all that. Yeah. Is there any technology at this point that's kind of being favored for that? I realize I'm sort of asking outside your, your program immediately, but. Yeah, no, I I've been involved with a couple of, of those studies. Um, I think, you know, my, my personal favorite is, is uh, something probably to do with melting because if you start melting, you're going to melt through the ice shell, right? It might take a longer amount of time, but if you put plutonium on a piece of, on a hunk of spacecraft, you're going through the ice shell, whether you want to or not on some time mm -hmm. scale, right? So I, I think that's probably my my current preferred favorite for, for, for really for that reason. It's almost, well, I don't want to say it's, uh, 
would definitely work because I'll jinx everything for the future. But, you know, um, <laughs> it seems... We've got to knock on the wood. Right, there. right of course. <laughs> but, it's all knock on wood. <laughs> it's cleanly simple, though, compared yeah, to but it's, drilling the, or something. Right. You know? The physics really makes sense. And we've we've learned a lot of lessons from when we tried to drill on other planetary bodies, right? Mm-hmm. There's always surprises. There are always lessons to be learned when you try and drill on other planetary bodies. Um, so it seems more like, again, I'm going to knock on wood, a fail-safe, more <laughs> fail-safe method. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's my current favorite. The, the problem with uh, having to crawl through cracks and things like that is we really don't know whether cracks it would extend all the way through the ice shell. Again, there's a lot of flexing going on on Europa as it's orbiting Jupiter, and so we really don't know if cracks stay open, if they would even go very far, how deep they would really go. And so there's a, there's a lot of you know, um, complications with that as well. I I was going to ask about Europa Clipper's relationship with the potential landing mission as well, but there was something. And, uh, and if, if, if if it's a little off topic, please let me know, Mm -hmm. but I've seen two science fiction movies, uh, Aaron, where Europa is like the center star. And, and in, in the first one, and it's, 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 it's from, (laughs) it's, it's an oldie. In the first one, we are clearly warned in 2010 yep. uh, <laughs> that we could go to all of the the worlds in the solar system uh, except Europa. And Attempt that we're no landing to... there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and then in the Europa report, we find out why we don't want to attempt a landing there. <laughs> and I'm not going to spoil it for everyone, but there there is a surprise. You can't not... spoil a funky beat movie, my friend. <laughs> That was a goofball um, film. Yeah, I mean there there are there are there are surprising creatures. I will just say that to say Europa those. spiders. Yeah, so, <laughs> I guess the question is, as a scientist, yeah, have we not learned our lessons yet <laughs> about going to this place, or or is it just too tantalizing a target that we have to figure out? Because I could see the the from a serious note the the contamination concerns of anything like even what happens with Europa Clipper mm-hmm. uh, when when it can't stay in orbit anymore yeah. uh, we would want to protect Europa for it um, absolutely and how big of a worry of 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 both the can- the contamination to the moon itself would we have to be for that for that sort of thing and then do we have to protect against contamination for whatever lander uh, you Definitely. know from the moon itself too yeah, first I'll just say, I mean, I think the reason, you know, those examples are like crop up in, in the popular culture, right, is because of how interesting Europa is, right? I mean, it's it sparks people's imaginations, which is really great. Um, but yeah, we definitely have to think about uh, contamination of or controlling the contamination of Europa, right? And so for the, the disposal plan for Europa Clipper, for when it can't be in orbit anymore because we're out of propellant, we can't keep it in that uh, orbit anymore, uh, we're going to actually dispose of it in Ganymede, on Ganymede right now. So right now the disposal plan is to crash it into Ganymede, um, which would be really cool. Uh, Of course, we don't like to think about (laughs) crashing the spacecraft when we haven't even launched it yet, but that is the disposal plan. Um, All those poor farmers in the sky, right? (laughs) They're going to have a surprise. Right. And so... um, we definitely have concerns about contaminating Europa. The spacecraft has to be very clean um, for that reason. Um, we have to, you know, show that there, there's such a small probability of, of contaminating Europa. I think it's like it's under 0.001%. Like it's some crazy low number, maybe even 10 to the minus four. I don't even remember exactly, but it, a really, really low percentage chance of an introducing anything from Earth onto Europa. And um, that would definitely be true with anything in the future that lands on Europa as well. And that's one of the, you know, uh, reasons why it's another reason why it's difficult to engineer um, these spacecraft that are going to any really any body that is that has the potential to have life um, is we don't want we want to make sure that it is life from that body right and not something that we took with us uh, from Earth and that we're just we've now convinced ourselves um, is life somewhere else. That, that Ganymede, Ganymede is is the largest moon in the in the mm-hmm. solar system. I mean, yeah. and is, isn't it icy as well, or yeah. or mm-hmm. it's, it's just less to worry about than, than Europa? Yeah, so it's it's also an icy moon. It also has a liquid water ocean, and it's actually so big that we think there's another layer of ice underneath that because of how big and how pressurized it is. Um, but uh, the ice shell on Ganymede is is really thick. Um, and so we don't think there's a lot of or really any communication between the surface and the subsurface ocean on wow. Ganymede. And so, again, crashing something into the surface of Ganymede would never make it into the ocean. 
Whereas we have that concern on Europa, we do think there's exchange between the surface and the subsurface ocean. And so we want to make sure that we don't put anything on the surface that could contaminate the ocean. So I'll, I'll ask for your indulgence up front because I'm going back to your father's time here. <laughs> but um, if I recall properly, the Viking landers are still the gold standard for sterilization. Uh, they went through this shake and bake process of, I mean, shaking was for launch test, but uh, <laughs> they were scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed with solvents and antibacterials and so mm -hmm. forth during assembly and then baked in ovens at I think 300 degrees for 40 hours, if I remember correctly, which you could do with electronics back then because they were pretty crude and fairly large scale and very heavily built. My understanding is that most modern electronics and spacecraft won't stand up to that kind of abuse. So how do you go about doing that level of sterilization with something that may go to a, a living body? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question that I, I don't fully know the answer to. I knew they, I know they do bake out a lot of the components of the spacecraft. Hmm. And then I know that, um, I guess I know a little more about what they do on the other end of that to make sure that they're not um, uh, including other, you know, other microbes or bacteria on the spacecraft. So there's a lot of uh, in sometimes in in the high bay, you'll see they're all in bunny suits, right, all the mm -hmm. time. And that's to help with that contamination, make sure they're not introducing skin particles or hair particles or whatever um, onto right. the spacecraft. And then sometimes in the high bay, you'll see people come in there and they have these almost like giant little Q-tips and they're like wiping different parts of the spacecraft to, um, and that, that they'll then take back and test and make sure that they haven't exceeded a certain amount of, of contamination on the spacecraft. And so, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they, how they keep uh, the electronics um, under under contamination control, but um, I know they do a lot of testing um, after they've done different procedures like baking out and just cleaning in general uh, to make sure that they haven't contaminated the spacecraft. So I'm going to ask you to put on your science fiction hat for a moment. Okay. And uh, JPL management, pardon me for asking this question, but <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> I'm a friend of the family, so I have to. Just in very broad terms, in your personal opinion, not locking anyone to anything and not giving away any secret ITAR controlled information, um, what would have to happen between the arrival of this spacecraft and the commitment to go do a surface sample and perhaps a get down to the ocean mission? Yeah, um, uh, I think that, you know, creating a landed mission or, or a mission that's going to um, that get to Europa's ocean is, is that technology, it exists, right? We, we have that technology, we could do it. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I've heard thrown around a, a lot is, you know, we don't have that technology. That's not true. We do. That technology exists. We could do those things. Um, but we don't, again, we don't know how thick Europa's ice shell is. We don't know what Europa's surface looks like down to a level uh, that we would typically expect when we land on a body. So Mars has really spoiled us, right? We have images right. down to a, a quarter of a centimeter per pixel or something ridiculous like that. The, the highest resolution images that we have of Europa right now are six meters per pixel. Mm -hmm. And that's six in meter. one, yeah, that's in one <laughs> tiny postage damp spot right on Europa. Right. And so we, again, so six meters per pixel, yeah, you know, it's like the size of a bus <laughs> per pixel. Yeah. We couldn't see if there were buses roving around on Europa right now. Um, so, so Clipper is really going to enable any potential future mission to Europa through those two, even just those two basic things, taking images of the surface down to a really high resolution. I think ice can get down to half a meter per pixel, which would make engineers a lot more comfortable landing on a surface like that. Um, and then also understanding the thickness of the ice shell, especially if you're gonna try and get through the ice shell. Right now, we don't even know if there are liquid pockets of water in the ice shell. I mean, again, we have the technology, we could do that, but it's all about reducing that risk, right? We wanna make sure that we understand where we're going um, so that we can build the right thing to go there to do what we wanna do. Well, uh, I hope it all goes well 
Aaron, we, we definitely wish you the best. I, I just realized that we got this far into our, our discussion and I forgot to say when Europa Clipper is launching because it's yes. launching this year. Yes. <laughs> it's launching um, in October. <laughs> yeah. Octo- the last date I saw was October 10th on a Falcon yep. Heavy rocket, a uh, SpaceX yep. Falcon Heavy rocket. Mm-hmm. Um, so hoping that we'll have a, a nice uh, European uh, Halloween uh, mm-hmm. there. And I was curious because we have talked a lot about the specifics of the mission, the spacecraft itself, the science that it can do. But I'm just curious if there's one thing to you that is like special, that like it's your favorite thing, either about the spacecraft or the mission, or maybe it's about Europa mm. um, that we haven't talked about. Like that, that that's, that's, that's purely, you know, um, like, like a fact for joy, your favorite part of like this whole mission overall. Um, oh, um, I think we've talked a lot about um, my favorite parts about the mission. Again, one, just that all of the instruments are going to be taking data at the same time really unique, really powerful for a mission. It's one of my favorite things about this mission. And it also creates this environment on the team of like all having to work together, right? So there's there's 10 investigations, nine instruments, um, but we really are one team because we're all taking data together and we all have this one goal of understanding Europa's habitability. And we need all of the lines of evidence to do that. And so that's really one of my favorite things about Europa Clipper in general. I would say my favorite thing about Europa, uh, man, I just, again, as a geologist, I can't get over the surface. I mean, you just, you look at it, it's crazy. It's like nothing else that we see in the solar system. Google it, look it up. It's amazing. Um, We, we, there's not another surface like it and it's crazy. Wow. And hopefully one of those concurrent uh, observations will be in a new epic and amazing images of the surface. Can you imagine a sunrise? On, on Europa, uh, yeah. you know, while it's taking like measurement data of, of, the, of the ocean. All yeah. right. All right. Uh, I can't wait. Well, so I, I know you're that. you're waiting for a black monolith, Tark. Uh, I think a lot of people are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly am. And I was around to see that movie the first time. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today for our, our first so far and only Europa clip episode, which has made this exciting. Um, and I want to remind everybody, if you have comments or questions, feel free to send them along to twist at twit.tv. Uh, Aaron, where's the best place for us to track your personal progress or the programmatic progress towards this, this mission? Um, well, you can always follow us on europa.nasa.gov. And um, I have a website on JPL's web, uh, on JPL's space. So you can find that as well if you want information about me personally. Um, but more interesting, probably europa.nasa.gov. Look for the launch in this October. Um, it's going to be really exciting, and and we're all very, very excited. See, Tark, that that's what somebody who's modest is like. <laughs> hey, look at the program. What, Don't whatever, look at me. Whatever do you mean? Rod? But speaking of immodest, <laughs> since I since I use a lot of I adjectives to describe you, where where can we uh, track you playing your video games, Tark? Well, you can find me at space.com as always, or on the Twitter at uh, Tarek J uh, Malik. You know, uh, this weekend I don't think we got a lot of launch stuff going on, so I'm going to just uh, take it easy. And uh, uh, it's not space, and it's not water, but uh, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have arrived in Fortnite, and I'll, uh, I'll be checking that out. Maybe we'll find mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, on Europa, right? You we don't know. know. We you don't know, know until we go there. So you never know. <laughs> is it just my age that this is embarrassing? Uh, Aaron, I hope if the uh, JPL Technology Highlights book comes back that I'll have a chance to sit down and interview you about this massive success next year. So fingers crossed because I've enjoyed doing that for a long time. Um, and of course, you can find me at pilebooks.com. My ink increasingly creaky website and at astromagazine.com which is updated every quarter don't forget to drop us a line as i mentioned at twist at twit.tv that's t-w-i-s at twit.tv we welcome your comments suggestions and ideas most of them anyway but we do answer all our emails at least i do and don't forget to check out space.com the website's in the name you can keep up on everything europa clipper right there and the National Space Society at NSS.org, both are good places to satisfy your space flight cravings. New episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll take whatever you got, as long as it's five stars or five thumbs or five somethings. <laughs> and you can head to our website at twit.tv.twis. Finally, don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit as well as some extras that are only available there for about $7 a month. You've heard Leo talk about 
the tough times facing podcasters. We're certainly experiencing those. So please step up and be counted. It, it, this may even be better than NPR. Ooh, now I've, I've thrown down the gauntlet, haven't I? Gary Gross is going to come after us. But it's certainly cheaper than NPR. So, hey, be counted. You can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you next week.